Today, we're going to uncover the chilling truth behind Russia's cyber warfare tactics and how they've been quietly influencing the world stage for decades. From targeting elections to infiltrating government systems, today we'll discover how Russia's deep-rooted disinformation networks and cyber capabilities have evolved and what experts predict for the future. So, let's get into this in-depth exploration of Russia's cyber warfare strategies and the impact that they've had and will have on global politics. On December the 26th, 1991, the Cold War came to a quiet and anticlimactic end. The Soviet Union officially completed its dissolution. The nation of Russia assumed control over most of its former assets, and the United States moved into a position of unipolar global authority that it has spent over two decades attempting to preserve. Take a quick glance at the international order over the last 22 years, and that description will seem fairly accurate. Gone are the days of bipolar proxy conflicts, out-of-control nuclear stockpiles, and a network of global hegemony enforced by physical walls and demilitarized zones. The major powers still play political chess every now and then, Syria, Libya, Ukraine, but the world is a far cry from what it was, even just in recent history. Except then we look at the digital world, and that new order of things starts to fall apart a bit. Even as the land wars took a brief pause, even as the American and Soviet networks of spies and handlers returned home, confrontations between Russia and the Western world never really ended. Instead, they moved online, into a realm of cyber espionage and subversive interference that became Russia's new preferred means of engagement. From early attacks in the 1990s to targeted cyber aggression in the 2000s and 2010s, to a new sort of hybrid warfare being waged in Ukraine as we speak, Russia's probing attacks and displays of power never really ended. Instead, they moved online, and the United States, the European Union, and a long list of former Soviet states have all found themselves in the crosshairs. With Vladimir Putin's international stature quickly deteriorating, and a Russian nation that's looking more and more like a bit of a pariah state, it seems increasingly likely that Russia's cyber war on the West has only just begun. When you think of a Russian cyber attack, any number of incidents may come to mind, but we'd be willing to bet that the first one you thought of wasn't Moonlight Maze. Moonlight Maze was one of the first large-scale cyber espionage incidents ever uncovered, in which thousands of sensitive US documents relating to military technology were stolen from the Pentagon, NASA, the Department of Energy, and elsewhere. The infiltration was first discovered in 1998, but by then, it had already been going on for years. Whoever the attackers were, they were setting up sophisticated, multi-layered attack networks that used IP addresses from universities and small businesses in order to conceal their identities. But they did have some tells that indicated who they might be. The attackers didn't work on Russian Orthodox holidays. They worked the hours of a standard Russian business day, and whenever they slipped up with their proxy disguises, they revealed internet connections that seemed to come from Russia. When the FBI attempted to coordinate with the Russian government, a Russian general was initially assigned to aid them. However, he then disappeared without explanation, and Russian assistance was suddenly withdrawn. According to researcher Thomas Ritt, the people behind Moonlight Maze evolved into a modern Russian speaking cyber espionage group known as Turla. And this brings us to the first of many important notes on Russian cyber warfare strategy. Their preference to rely on a web of sponsored cyber criminals, hacker collectives, and front companies, rather than setting up a cyber force alongside its air force or navy. And this is a highly intentional move to give the Russian government plausible deniability for any attacks that it orders. As such, you'll hear us refer to Russian hackers as the perpetrators of some attacks, rather than the Russian government. But Russia and its private cyber actors uh, deeply entangled with one another, and we're going to pass out attacks that didn't appear to include any involvement from the Russian state. Given the complex and hidden nature of cyber espionage, it's hard to say what else Russia was doing online during this time, but in 2007, Russia's online army changed tactics dramatically. In April 2007, Russia did something that it had never done before. It attacked an entire country, the small Baltic nation of Estonia, over real-world geopolitical tensions. The Estonian government had just recently decided to remove a statue of a Red Army soldier from the capital, Tallinn, which seemed reasonable given that the Estonian people largely viewed the Red Army as former occupiers rather than protectors. Russia, however, didn't see it that way, and their response was 
Pierce. A targeted fake news campaign agitated Russian-speaking residents of Estonia, leading to riots in the capital, and one day later, the cyber attacks began. These attacks used a method known as Distributed Denial of Service, or DDoS, in which an attacker floods a website or a network with a massive amount of internet traffic, forcing it to shut down or just operate extremely slowly. In Estonia, the entire state was the target. Government websites, media organizations, the financial industry, and more. This was especially impactful in Estonia, where the government had committed to going entirely paperless, and was already most of the way there by 2007. Over the following weeks, the nation was thrown into confusion as it became increasingly clear that a foreign power could simply take their whole government out of commission. Estonia is a member of NATO, and although it was clear that a NATO member had been targeted for disruption, this wasn't the kind of attack that could be countered in force. The available evidence suggested that the attack had been coordinated by the Kremlin using those networks of third-party actors that we already mentioned. But Russia didn't take credit. The responsible party couldn't be conclusively identified, and even if they were, NATO didn't have any means to retaliate. This signaled to Russia there was open season, and over the next two years, they would attack virtual targets with impunity. In June 2008, Russia responded to a Lithuanian law outlawing the display of Soviet symbols by hacking into Lithuanian government servers and defacing them with hammer and sickle graffiti and other Soviet imagery. In August, Russia shut down internet services for the small nation of Georgia, making internal communication impossible while waging a real-world war over the regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. In January 2009, Russian hackers has ratcheted up pressure on the president of Kyrgyzstan, who they were attempting to coerce into evicting a U.S. military base from the country. To accomplish this, they crashed two of Kyrgyzstan's four internet service providers, and when the president met their demands, Russia responded by sending billions of dollars in aid. Something, something, carrot and stick. In April 2009, a Kazakh media organization was shut down by another DDoS attack after they criticized the Russian government, and in August 2009, Russian hackers celebrated the first anniversary of their invasion of Georgia by shutting down Georgian Twitter and Facebook. After the years-long hacking spree, Russia quietened down its cyber attacks for a while, and it's probably no accident that NATO adopted countermeasures to consider cyber attacks as a threat to Euro-Atlantic security around this same time. But this quiet appeared to coincide with a few years of more careful planning by Russia, with 2012 papers by Vladimir Putin and Russia's head of the military advocating for a wider use of the internet and social media to achieve their goals abroad. The Kremlin is believed to have reorganized its cyber warfare structures during this time, moving Russian intelligence into more of a direct command role, and there's some evidence to suggest that Russian cyber actors may have taken a brief detour into more pedestrian online crimes. But this quiet wouldn't last for long, and Russia's lessons learned from their first wave of attacks were merged with an acute awareness of a changing digital landscape. Instead of breaking new grounds, this time they were going to be ahead of the curve. The Kremlin's new fascination in the cyber realm turned out to be electoral politics and the ways that fiddling around with social media and political parties' internal servers could benefit Russia in the long term. There were some other major Russian cyber attacks during this time, which we'll cover later in today's video, but broadly speaking, their goals were to subvert and influence foreign elections and leverage any intelligence or disinformation that might help sway the result. In May of 2014, fresh off Putin's annexation of Crimea, a Russian hacking group brought down Ukraine's election commission and their online systems. Ukraine uh, was slated to have a presidential election in three days' time, but the hackers disabled both the electoral systems and their backups. Luckily, Ukraine was able to bring their systems back online before the election, and as a result, the attack backfired. Russia's favored candidate in the election lost. Undeterred, Russia tried again a year later, this time in Germany. In this attack, Russia infiltrated the German national parliament, stealing information not just about the parliament itself, but NATO and prominent German politicians. The hackers also launched targeted attacks against the Christian Democratic Union, Chancellor Angela Merkel's political party. The organization behind the attack was identified by cybersecurity agency Trend Micro as Pawn Storm, a sophisticated group with a history of carrying out attacks against basically everybody except for Russia. Pawn Storm is just one name for the cyber espionage group. They're also known as the Sophocy Group, Strontium, SAR Team, and most prominently, Fancy Bear. 
The group is believed to have deep connections to Russian GRU, military intelligence, and it's believed to be affiliated with another major hacking group, Cozy Bear. It was these two groups together, Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, that were responsible for large-scale cyber attacks against the United States Democratic National Committee, or DNC, leading up to the 2016 election. The groups probably were working parallel to each other rather than collaborating directly, but regardless, they were able to use targeted phishing emails to gain access to the DNC's network. The phishing attack is the sort of thing you might receive in your email, a message containing a dodgy link you definitely shouldn't click on, while in a spear phishing attack, the author of that message tailors it in a way that they will believe will convince a recipient to click said link anyway. Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear used spear phishing to successfully break into the DNC's systems, and once they were inside, they stole information from high-level email accounts, infected computers with malware, and sent a massive cache of stolen emails to WikiLeaks. These info dumps ramped up, leading to the presidential election in November, one where Russia's clearly favored candidate Donald Trump would win the presidency. In the following years, Russia would continue to interfere in elections in the United States, Germany, and elsewhere, and it's likely that some of their campaigns probably weren't discovered. Also during this time, Russia attempted to steal a report from a Dutch government system on Flight MH17, which was shot down by pro-Russian rebels in Ukraine, and they also tried to infiltrate Finland's foreign ministry. Cozy Bear was also believed to be responsible for the Solar Winds attack in 2020, in which thousands of major U.S. companies and U.S. government agencies installed updates that were engineered to create backdoors within their systems that Russian hackers could later enter. This attack compromised the Pentagon, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, Microsoft, Intel, Cisco, and countless other entities, some of which might still not know that they'd been hacked. In 2021, a Russian hacking group perpetrated the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, causing a major American oil pipeline to temporarily shut down, and a separate Russian cyber military group was revealed to have been infiltrating U.S. infrastructure services for years prior to their discovery. Not only did these continued attacks appear to advance Russia's goals around the world, but they also put Russian cyber warfare on the map in a big way way, and they created a lingering threat that could help undermine Europe and the United States while consolidating Russia's own sphere of influence abroad. Unlike nuclear deterrence, Russia could use cyber attacks to make good on its threats and effectively intimidate and bully nations around the world. In addition to Russia's attempts to manipulate global politics, they've also engaged in a second, more insidious form of online aggression disinformation. More so than most other nations, Russia was quick to recognize the power of social media in swaying public opinion and introducing discontent at the grassroots level. In 2016, the RAND Corporation referred to Russia's disinformation tactics as a fire hose of falsehood, a continuous deluge of content meant not to change minds in one go, but to orchestrate a slow ideological shift among vulnerable users online. To understand how this strategy works, it's important to separate it from how we typically think of propaganda. For example, during the Cold War, an effective method of spreading US propaganda within Soviet Russia might have been, say, a pamphlet outlining the faults with communist rule and explaining the value of a free market economy. Not so on social media, though, where Russia's propaganda simply isn't designed to present a coherent argument in any direction. Instead, it relies on entertainment value, emotional responses, and sheer volume in an attempt to harness the force underneath all social media, and that, of course, is engagement. This entire process probably deserves an entire video itself, but suffice to say that the Russian model of disinformation involves publishing sky-high volumes of content, which often isn't particularly well done, and letting social media algorithms determine what sticks. The goal isn't to indoctrinate individual Westerners, but instead to make online discourse more contentious, more polarized, and more willing to accept new information without double-checking to make sure that that information is credible. Russia's disinformation campaign is an effective attempt at social engineering, one which demonstrates an accurate understanding of how Western audiences consume their media and how they choose which media to trust. By manipulating this process, Russian propagandists have been able to introduce a wide range of narratives to Western discourse. To do this, state-sponsored Russian troll farms run thousands upon thousands of fake accounts on Twitter, Facebook, here on YouTube, and hundreds of other social media sites in a round-the-clock campaign that's been going on for nearly a decade. They disseminate their chosen messages by inundating various online spaces, using multiple sources, multiple arguments, and community-based measures to boost support and credibility. Their messages are overwhelming in volume. They are repetitive in their underlying points. 
and they come through posts, comments, pages, groups, channels, and more. With social media algorithms and trusting viewers more than happy to boost successful propaganda pieces even further. In fact, Will has a guess that you can probably catch an example of this if you look down in the comments below this video. I've definitely seen it before, and if not, then check out the comments under a Mega Projects video we did about China's Great Firewall. Excellent examples right there. It's a good example of how China does something similar, although it's not a carbon copy of Russian techniques. These disinformation campaigns have operated across much of the world in the last five to ten years, with major tech companies now on record admitting they played host to Russian propaganda networks. Their goals were far-reaching and varied. Stoke animosity toward a political leader here, spread as conspiracy theory there, perhaps sold the entire discourse online with some dank anti-Ukraine memes or forged messages meant to look like they're from official-sounding social media accounts. They've been hard at work in the United States, playing on and widening social divides during and after the Trump administration. They've undermined the European Union, attempted to influence major referendums and protests, and they stoke unrest and anti-Western sentiment in Africa. They attempt to spread falsehoods about key moments in history, and any nation that's found itself a target of Russia's military aggression, like Ukraine, has also been subject to a global campaign online meant to reduce public support for their resistance. And so, with that, let's let's talk about Ukraine, which we've intentionally waited to do thus far simply because uh, there's enough to talk about that we've got to devote an entire section of the video to it. Emboldened by their success in Georgia with a hybridized digital and conventional warfare attack, Russia used the same playbook during their thinly veiled invasion of Crimea in 2014. As pro-Russian insurgents stormed the peninsula, a massive DDoS attack crippled Ukraine's internet infrastructure, rendering established methods of communication unusable while thickening the fog of war over Crimea itself. It was just months after that when Russia attempted to influence Ukraine's presidential elections, as we've already discussed. In 2015, Russia flexed its cyber muscle again, taking remote control of a power station and causing an outage to hundreds of thousands of homes. In 2016, a second attack on a power substation in Kyiv was less successful. In 2017, Russia really stepped it up with the now infamous ransomware attack known as NotPetya. In this kind of attack, a piece of malicious software or malware infects a targeted system and locks it, demanding ransom in order to release the information that it's now holding onto and return access to the system. Whether the ransomware actually returns access once the ransom is paid or destroys the whole system anyway, just for funsies, depends on the attack in question. But not Petya was pretty clearly not about the ransom at all. The attack targeted and incapacitated many major targets within Ukraine, including Chernobyl Power Plant and the National Bank of Ukraine. It also spiraled way out of control. The malware spread across the world in a way that didn't necessarily appear to be intentional, comprising major companies like Maersk, TNT Express, Merck, and even the Russian state oil company Rosneft, as oh, well as multiple hospitals in the US. In all, the attack would incur over $10 billion of losses worldwide, mainly consisting of lost records, documents, and other forms of data. The entire ordeal came courtesy of Mother Russia. And though it's not believed that Putin intended to cause quite that much devastation, well, has it a personal guess that he probably didn't mind? For the next several years, Russian cyber attacks in Ukraine were ongoing, but at the start of 2022, they really took off. On January the 14th, 70 Ukrainian government websites fell under control of Russian hackers, and although they were later restored to Ukraine, many of them would be knocked out again in the following month. Just days later, many of those sites were taken down again, and a computer virus known as Hermetic Wiper infected a hundred Ukrainian organizations, wiping data on any computer system that it touched. A day after Hermetic Wiper, Russia invaded with their conventional military and launched a suite of attacks meant to knock out Ukraine's internet, just like they'd done in Georgia and Crimea. After this time, the Russian cyber attacks on Ukraine came too fast and too high in number to go through here, using a combination of phishing, malware, ransomware, DDoS, and many other means. Their targets included Ukrainian government, industrial, and civilian digital infrastructure, foreign allies, non-government organizations and aid groups, and online discourse surrounding the invasion. This even included a so-called deepfake video, which purported to show Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling for a surrender. For the first months of the invasion, Russia threw everything they had at Ukraine's online presence in an increasingly desperate attempt to keep their initial invasion on track. 
But since the early days of the war, Russia's success rate with its cyber attacks has noticeably fizzled, both due to Ukraine's enhanced and intentionally supported cybersecurity measures, and also due to Russia's own inability to successfully leverage the cyber criminals and private syndicates that they'd relied on in the past. While they've got no shortage of enthusiasm, Russia's actual effectiveness has been dramatically lower than what international observers had expected before the war. Like many elements of Russia's military threat, there are elements of its cyber warfare capability that now more closely resemble a paper tiger than the legitimate deterrent the Western world had previously believed it to be. Russia's operational failures in Ukraine will haunt it for decades to come on the international stage, with global flashpoints like Armenia and Azerbaijan already beginning to show signs of unrest now that their regional hegemon seems incapable of enforcing its will. As of now, all signs point to an increasingly isolated Russia on the world stage, a nation that is quickly turning into a pariah state like Iran, Sudan, or North Korea. In this likely version of the future, the specter of the Russian military will have lost quite a bit of its meaning, looking more like a petulant toddler with an armful of nuclear weapons than a menacing local sheriff. But this creates a more complex dynamic where cyber warfare is concerned, because despite Russia's limited success in Ukraine, cyberspace has been the area where Putin has been able to flex his muscle most effectively for decades. Maybe the Russian military can't keep a supply line for more than 40 kilometers, they sure as hell can build malware like NotPetya, and they already possess deeply entrenched disinformation networks on most of the world's social media platforms. As a result, this makes cyber warfare an increasingly appealing option for Russia to exert influence in the future, lashing out from inside its borders without having to expose its own military to embarrassment or battlefield devastation. In the immediate future, cybersecurity experts anticipate that Russia will learn from its struggles in Ukraine, as it's done with prior failures in cyber warfare. Russian intelligence may learn to better coordinate hybrid attacks, shift their focus to more vulnerable pieces of infrastructure, or pick different targets altogether, such as Ukraine's NATO allies. Russia's ability to launch large-scale cyber attacks against the West is still a meaningful and worrying specter, one that the United States, Great Britain, Germany, France, Poland, and many other nations do factor into their decision-making. And whenever it happens, the war in Ukraine will eventually end. And a brief disclaimer here, we record these a few weeks in advance. So if Russia is somehow withdrawn by the time this video comes out, please know we're pleasantly surprised. But a Russian cyber strategy before and during the invasion suggests that they will probably attempt to continue cyber attacks in Ukraine anyway, disrupting infrastructure, undermining the Ukrainian government, and continuing to breathe life into the separatist movement among some of Ukraine's easternmost citizens. Now, with that being said, it also stands to reason that Russia will have a harder time making ends meet for their cyber offensive capabilities than they have in the past. Western tech companies have largely closed up shop in Russia, and with them went critical hardware and software resources that now won't be replaced or updated. Tech-savvy Russians are leaving the country quicker and quicker, and the country's expenditure on its war in Ukraine means that R&D budgets are probably going to be smaller than before. It's possible for Russia to do more with less, but it certainly won't be easy, especially if the nation's leaders are characteristically unwilling to let go of the fast planes and big guns that have traditionally signaled their strength. If we had told Vladimir Putin two years ago how international perceptions of Russia have evolved today, he probably would have been exceptionally displeased. But Putin's failed incursion into Ukraine has done a better job laying out Russia's limitations than every Western analyst combined, and the ramifications for our world order will continue to play out for a very long time. But even in the face of a broadly diminishing Russia, it's crucial to understand that the country's cyber warfare capabilities are not so cut and dry. Despite a recent string of bad luck, Russia's intricate network of military intelligence, troll and hacker farms, and private cyber warfare specialists have had a significant impact on the world for decades, and their capabilities, tactics, and sphere of influence have continued to improve from year to year. As Russia's international role changes, it will need to shift priorities, and chances are its offensive cyber warfare capabilities will be a meaningful part of that calculus. The world becomes more dependent on its digital infrastructure every day, and Russia's ability to disrupt that infrastructure is one of precious few places that it still holds a global advantage. Whether the future holds a continued hot war in Ukraine, a return to Cold War posturing and subversion, or something else entirely, Russia is going to be a part of it. 
And so as long as that's true, Russia's cyber war against the West is something that we're all just going to have to get used to.